And here we are again, back with epistemology, and we're looking at theories of perception. And we are focusing in for, the, uh, for these videos on indirect realism. And the previous video was talking all about indirect realism and how they explain uh, perception, including the ideas of John Locke and primary and secondary qualities and the idea of ideas and sense data. But today, moving on to the problems with indirect realism. And one way that you could record notes on this is to go to Teams and have a look at a recap sheet that I've put on. Um, it does help with this, really, because what we're going to be looking at is looking at the attacks that Locke has to face and how, then, in the green, how he argues his case and tries to defend defend himself. So it very much is a kind of dialogue or discussion, um, this part of the topic. OK, then, so problems with indirect realism can really be summed up in one thing. And that is that the argument from indirect realism leads to scepticism about the existence of mind independent objects and the external world at all. So remember, scepticism is asking what we can know. Can we know anything? Perhaps we know nothing about a world beyond our minds. So why is it that indirect realism leads to scepticism? Well, think about it. The main reason is that we are claiming that we do not have direct access to the physical world. We only have indirect access to the physical world. And what we receive are only representations of it. So as a result, how can we really know anything about an external world and the objects within it. So think about this. It leads to questions about whether our perceptions of the external world are accurate. So how can we know what colour that shoe box is? And even more significantly, how can we know that an external world exists at all? How can I know that there are any shoe boxes beyond my mind? So indirect realism has opened the door to scepticism of our knowledge of external uh, an external world and any objects within it. OK, let's expand on what the situation is there. And um, so whether our perceptions of the external world are accurate, I want you to recall uh, Locke's ideas and Russell's ideas. And they were both clear on the view that what we're getting are representations of the external world. And some of these are through secondary qualities, such as colour and taste. And remember that these are only arbitrarily related to the object itself. Do you remember that? that the secondary qualities do not need to resemble the object. So the orangeness of the shoebox isn't found in the object itself, but in the abilities of the qualities to cause that impression on us. So they have this power to cause an impression on us. Now, let's think about the impact of that idea. So if this is the case, how do we know whether our idea, sense data of the object, is a good representation of the object. We have no way of checking as we can only access these objects indirectly. So look where indirect realism has led us to an inability to access the world directly and this has led sceptics to claim, now there's a veil of perception between us and the world. There's this kind of a block. Um, there's something that is in between us that's stopping any kind of direct knowledge of the world.
Okay, so that's the situation we're facing with indirect realism, that we can't know anything that's accurate about an external world. Well, there are different responses that we could use um, to, to claim that actually our perceptions of the external world do seem to be accurate. So firstly, let's have a look at these red berries. So our perception of redness of berries seems to have worked quite well up to now. So a defence has been in the claim that our perception of the world um, as it is, must be pretty accurate as we've managed to survive. So we've perceived colours, locations of food and been able to sustain ourselves. So our perception, you know, we haven't po all poisoned ourselves with these, you know, dangerous berries. So what we perceive and what is in the world must correspond quite closely. So that's one way we could argue that our perception must be pretty accurate just on past experience and survival. And another way that we could um, defend against this attack is the testimony of others. So, you know, I bite into an apple and I say, oh, that's sharp. And you have one of the same bunch of apples and you agree. And this shared perception um, this corroboration between you know, our accounts seems to strengthen the idea that actually our perceptions are quite accurate of the objects that we claim to perceive. Okay, so shared testimony of others. Okay, so I've lifted this from Lacewing. Um, and it is showing that we can we can make our scepticism even more global um, in the sense that indirect realism makes us question whether there is any external world beyond us and our minds. So um, he points to Russell in the problems of philosophy and says that one of the main problems Russell identifies <clears throat> is whether we can know that objects really exist at all. If all we perceive are sense data, then how do we know what causes them? We assume that sense data are caused by objects, but how do we know this is true? We no longer have any direct access to objects themselves within direct realism. So we only infer that they exist through the mediation of sense data. So the external world may not exist outside our minds. The problem can be expressed as an explanatory gap because we do not directly perceive the cause of our perceptions. And this leads to scepticism about whether the external world exists. So remember, all we've got is this sense data and we are inferring we infer that this sense data is caused by objects beyond our minds but we don't know there's an explanatory gap so how does Locke go about responding to this um, suggestion that we cannot know anything about uh, the external world. Well, Locke almost holds his hands up and admits that we cannot have complete certainty that an external world exists. We cannot uh, provide a completely watertight deductive argument that reaches that conclusion. But what we can do is provide evidence um, to uh, construct quite uh, a convincing inductive argument to prove that there is something beyond our own mind. Um, and one of these things that he uses is the fact that many of the sensations, or many of the ideas that we um, are aware of are not things that we choose and they seem to be forced on us. They can be unpleasant. So we seem to find ourselves experiencing, seeing, smelling things that we, we cannot control. And this certainly implies that sensations are coming from something other than our own mind, something external to us.
But then the sceptics come back and they respond to Locke and they would argue that, well, how do you know that you're not dreaming? We often dream, have sensations of things that um, are unpleasant, bad dreams, um, and things that we don't choose. How do you know that you're not dreaming? Or how do you know that um, a supercomputer or perchance from Descartes, an evil demon is actually manipulating your brain just to experience um, these illusions of an external world. So how can we know for certain that an external world exists if we can't access it directly? Okay, and look again, look sort of a response that the evidence that we're providing isn't deductive. It can never be a deductive proof of um, an external world, but it is more than enough to actually be convincing. And Locke is unconvinced that dreaming is a, a problem. He thinks that we can differentiate between dreams, unpleasant dreams and unpleasant reality. And he gives the example of being, you know, uh, putting your hand in, into a furnace and dreaming about being in a furnace. And he said, you, it can't seriously be compared. He said, if you've ever tried it, you will know the difference. So again, he's saying, look, um, our experience tells us that this is enough to show that an external world exists. It's not deductive, it's not conclusive, but it is enough. And lot goes on. So he's already used the experience of sort of forced um, experiences, but now he, he arrives at another argument to uh, defend the existence of an external world with external objects in it. And this is the coherence of the senses. So Locke argued that the external world is likely, most likely to exist because our experience of one or more of our senses seem to support this account. So it's not just our sight, um, but our sight and our touch seem to marry up. For example, we don't just see a football. We can touch a football and the properties of that object seem to agree with the sense data so that we are feeling a roundness and a firmness and a size and the sight of it. And all of these things together, the corroboration of the senses, seems to suggest that these objects exist. Now, Locke gives a really nice example of this response, and he's bringing the idea, and this again is from Lacewing, Locke brings two ideas of corroboration together in this extended example of sort of writing and seeing what you're writing. So he's, it's about knowing from experience that I can change how a piece of paper looks by writing on it. So he's connecting sight and the sense of your hand moving. So I can plan what to write. I know in advance what the paper will look like, but I cannot bring about the sense data of seeing the paper or words on it just by imagination. I have to actually move um, and write. And once I've written something, I can't change the words I see. So this, this is showing that sense data aren't merely things that are in your head, so merely play things of the imagination. So they are actually things out there. And finally, if someone else reads those words, what I hear corresponds to what I intended to write. And this leaves little reason for doubt that the words exist outside of my mind, says Locke. Okay, so we've got the corroboration of moving, seeing, and, you know, other people corroborating um, our experience. Okay, so Locke on the corroboration of different uh, sensations. And someone else who backs him up is uh, somebody we haven't looked at before, and her name was Catherine Trotter-Coper. And she really supports and develops Locke's ideas on this, that a combination of the senses leads to evidence of the external world. So if we just follow her reasoning then, and she starts with, 
with saying that one sense alone cannot provide um, pr or prove an external world. Um, and this is because the sense data and the object do not resemble each other. And we know that through the secondary qualities. So the key to knowing about an external world is to experience change in objects, she says. So a change in one sense data can cause a change in another. And if these two things correspond, then we've got much more uh, likelihood of these things existing. For example, she said, if something gets hotter, it might get redder. And it, that's certainly the case with metal, isn't it? Um, and again, colours, colours and our perception of colours change depending on position of an object. So if we change the position, we change the colour. So she says that these changes are regular and consistent, and they do suggest that that these objects belong to an external reality. So this regularity and predictability of change of objects in several ways, so in colour and in size or in colour and in shape, they certainly um, build up quite a convincing argument that these objects actually do exist beyond our minds. But again, we could come back um, from the sceptical position and say, yeah, but how do you know? How do you know that you're not dreaming or there's not an evil demon who can make, seems to make our experiences cohere? You can't absolutely nail an external world. Um, but again, I think Coburn and Locke conclude that this just cannot be done, but we do have enough evidence um, to be persuaded that our sense data are actually being caused by things in the world. And I suppose what Locke and Coburn are doing is um, arguing for a form of the best explanation for our experience. And this is now what we're leading into with Bertrand Russell. And we come to a point that is really um, like common sense. And this is Russell's idea that an external world is the best hypothesis or theory for explaining why we experience the things we do. So why is it that we seem to see objects and you know, smell and touch things? And he says, well, the best explanation to explain what's going on there is that there are objects and these things actually exist in the world. So he sort of, he, he goes through in the problems of philosophy, he, he sort of goes through a dialogue. Um, but if I can just wish you through some of the main points that he makes. So starting on the left then. So I know that I cannot prove that an external world exists deductively. Um, but working up, we can argue that the existence of an external world is actually the best explanation that we can give to explain th this, these sensations or ideas. So one reason is that despite perceptual variations and colours changing and size and shape changing depending on where I'm standing, the majority of our perceptions seem similar and predictable. Now, people might argue against this in the brown blob, blob there, um, and they might point out that, oh, this depends on us assuming that there are other minds that exist and these, you know, that there are other people out there in the world. And they also point out, going to the orange blob, can we be sure that the people that we perceive in, in our sense data actually exist? Could it be that we are actually alone and we are just minds? Well, you know, Russell says, yes, OK, possibly. But a much better reason, going to the green blob, to argue and to, um, to explain our experiences, a much better reason is just to say that actually an external world does exist and this explains our everyday experiences. So I'm 
Now, I would like you to look up Bertrand Russell's example of the cat, and I've actually put that on the system for you to do. Um, but just as a really quick and brief um, mention of it, I'm just putting in Lacewing's example of Russell's point that he's making, and it concerns cats. Um, and he, he says this, if I see a cat first in the corner of the room and then later on the sofa, then if the cat is a physical object, it travelled from the corner to the sofa when I wasn't looking. If there is no cat apart from what I see in my sense data, then the cat does not exist when I don't see it. It springs into existence first in the corner and then later on the sofa. Nothing connects my two perceptions. But that's incredibly puzzling. Indeed, it is no explanation at all of why my sense data are the way they are at all. So the hypothesis that there is a physical object, the cat, which causes what I see, is the best explanation of my sense data. Now I'm going to want uh, you to, to look at this example in a bit more detail, so I've put instructions on how to do so on the system. And that's it.